Welcome, weary travelers, to a realm where time is but a fleeting whisper and imagination knows no bounds. Tonight, we embark on a journey through the cosmos, guided by the crackling voices of a bygone era. Prepare to be transported to a world where vintage radio dramas and science fiction converge in a mesmerizing dance of words and sounds. Our story tonight harkens back to a time when radio waves were the gateway to otherworldly realms. We join the crew of the colossal rocket, Luna, as humanity stands on the precipice of an extraordinary leap into the cosmos. Ready to hurtle towards the moon in a daring mission that captures the imagination and curiosity of Earth's inhabitants. As we traverse the vastness of space, listeners will be transported to a world where the unknown becomes a companion, and the cosmic symphony of celestial bodies is the backdrop to our gripping tale. Close your eyes and envision the hum of the spacecraft, the weightlessness of zero gravity, and the anticipation of what lies beyond the lunar horizon. Welcome to the Operation Luna Sleepcast, where the past and the future intertwine in a symphony of celestial whispers. Rest well, and may your dreams be as boundless as the galaxies above. Please remember to like and subscribe. October the 19th, 1965. In the Australian outback, many miles from the nearest town, stands the rocket ship that is about to carry Jet Morgan and his crew to the moon. Beside Jet, the captain, there are Stephen Mitchell, engineer, Lemmy Barnett, radio operator, and Doc Matthews. That's me. Already the scaffolding has been removed, and the ground crew have taken cover from the shattering rocket blast that is soon to send the moon ship on its way. Within the ship, outwardly calm and strapped to our couches, the four of us who are to make this momentous journey are anxiously waiting for our captain to launch us out into space. Zero minus 45 seconds. Hello, control. Stand by for firing. Standing by and good luck, Leonard. Switch on recorder. Recorder on. Doc, gyros. Gyros. Okay, Mitch. Okay, Jeff. Doc. Okay. Lemmy. Okay, I think. Stand by for count off. Don't anybody try to move. Don't even try to raise your head. Lemmy, lie down. Oh, I'm only getting count. Lie flat and stay flat. Firing in 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one contact. Jet, what's wrong? She's shaking like a leaf. Quiet, let me take your breath. She's shaking herself to pieces. Five, six point eight miles. Velocity three thousand seven hundred and fifty. Oh, oh, what's happening? Jet, I, I can't move. Zero plus twenty. Height twelve point one miles. Velocity four thousand three hundred and fifty. Oh. Oh, oh, don't stand it. Hang on, Lemmy. It won't last long. Oh, oh why did I ever come? Zero plus 30. I'm 27.2. Booster's paid out. Oh. Stand by to jettison booster. Oh, I wouldn't go through that again for all the rice in China. You'll be going through it again in just a few moments. Oh, no. I'll, I'll be pushed right through this couch and out the other side. You all set, Mitch? Yes, Jet. Doc? Ready? Okay, Doc. Booster. Jettison switch. Stand by. Jettison switch. Contact. Now. <laughs> Hello, Control. Booster stage jettisoned. Standing by to cut in atomic motor. Waiting for your signal. Over. 
Hello, Control. Booster now jettisoned. Waiting for your signal. Over. Hello, Control. Hello. What's up, Jet? They don't answer. Hello, Control. Hello. Lemmy, any idea what's wrong? Well, according to the indicator, she's still working. But if you ask me, the shot when you blew the booster off, it must have smashed every valve in the ship. Radar's still working, Jet. Hello, Control. Hello. We can't wait much longer, Jet. We're losing momentum every second. We won't make it. I'll give them one more try. If they don't answer, we'll have to use our own judgment. Hello, Control. Hello. Hello. Lemmy, switch on the teleview, stern view. Teleview, stern view, on. Stand by to cut in the motor, Mitch. We'll give up full power. Don't overdo it, Jet. We can't afford the fuel. Now watch the tank gauges. We'll cut out as soon as number one tank is empty. Are you ready? Ready. Then stand by. Everybody batten down. Okay, Jet. Atomic motor, fire. Lie flat. This is going to be unpleasant. Very unpleasant. Oh. being anyway. You all right? Yeah, I think so. Oh, boy, we must have hit 15 Gs at least. Mitch? Okay, I think. I. Oh. What's up, Mitch? Oh, I don't know. I, I feel like death. Yeah, lie still. Yeah, don't move. Let me? Okay, Jet. I'll think so anyway. We'd all better lie still for a few minutes. Well, let's hope we've hit the right speed. We certainly won't be under. You didn't switch off soon enough and we used up a little of the reserve fuel. You think we might be going too fast then? Maybe, but there's nothing we can do about it yet. I'm sorry, but the acceleration was so great, I thought I'd never press the switch. We must get through to control. Uh, Lemmy, if you feel fit enough, get up and get to work on that radio. Yes, Jet. Oh, as soon as you like. I'll get going. Oh, oh, here. Oh, 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 oh. Lemmy. He's drifting up to the ceiling. Jet, Jet, get me down. Help. Serves you right for getting off your bed without your boots on. All I did was bend down to pick him up, and I, I shot straight up here. You should have held on to your couch. Can't you throw him up to me? Pull yourself down by the rail, Lemmy. Oh, 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 just to move makes me feel worse. I, I feel just like a feather. Well, you certainly don't weigh anymore. Yeah, is it going to be like this all the way to the moon? I'm afraid so, but you'll get used to it. Now pull yourself down. It's slowly. Like this? Yeah, that's it. Now put your magnetized boots on, Lemmy. Yeah. In fact, I think we'd all better put them on. Okay, Jack. Yeah. And keep them on. Keep them on at all times while zero gravity conditions last. What, you, you mean we even wear them when we sleep? No, you can take them off then, but keep a good hold in your bunk while you do it, or you'll go drifting up to the roof again. Uh, well, that's mine fixed. Yeah. Well, there's no trouble standing. What's it like to walk, Doc? Oh, okay. Feel a bit um, lightheaded. Try walking up the wall. Hey? Yes, go on. Doc should be easy. <laughs> Hey, how's that? <laughs> if you could do that down on Earth, you'd earn a fortune in a circus. Well, come on, come on, try it. Come on, Lemmy, we'll have a walk on the wall. Don't hang up there like that. I feel bad enough as it is. Hey, what about that radio? Yes, cut out the fun and games. Try and get that radio working. How are you feeling, Mitch? Not so good. The radar's still working. Well, that's something. At least we'll be able to calculate our height above Earth. Yes, but we can't depend on the radar. Not for the whole trip. Well, we can depend on it for a few hours, yes. Well, for height, yes, but what about course? Now, don't you worry, Mitch. Let me all get that radio going. You can bet on it. I hope so. Well, how's it going? Twenty hours he's been at it, and not a peep out of the darn radio. Oh, take it easy, Mitch. He's doing his best. He's been working all this time with no sleep. We should never have brought him. He's psychologically unsuitable. That's a matter of opinion, but now he's here, the least we can do is let him get on with it. But why does he have to take so darn long? Doesn't he know every second is carrying us further and further away from the Earth, possibly to our deaths? Oh, it's not that bad, Mitch. We can figure our approximate speed and position if it comes to it. We'll 
could give Lemmy a couple of hours more. Yeah, what if he still hasn't got through to control? Well, we wait until our velocity has dropped to minimum and then turn the ship over and go back. Go back? Go back? This ship's not turning back. It's set out to land on the moon and it's going to do it. But if our speed is too high, we'll use up too much fuel during landing. We'll be on the moon, all right, but how do we get off again? We've got to take a chance. Oh, no, not that kind of chance. I'm not taking any unnecessary risks with the lives of this crew. If the radio isn't working within 48 hours, we're turning back. We're not turning back. Am I the captain of the ship or are you? Sure you are. As long as you carry out the job I hired you for. This ship is mine. I designed her. I built her and she's going to the moon. One more word out of you, Mitchell, I'll put you under arrest. <laughs> oh, that's funny, that is. Go on, try it. Try it. Just try and lay a hand on all me. All right, all right, Mitch, Jet. Break it up. Come on, you're carrying on like a couple of screws. You stay out of this, Doc. If I want your advice, I'll ask for now, it. Now, look, Jet. It for... seems we have a case of mutiny on our hands. Mutiny? Well, what else is it? Now, wait a minute, Jet. I didn't... All right, all right, we'll forget it. But if I decide to go back, we go back. Is that clear? Putting it all together again mm-hmm. now and, and hoping. Can I be of any help? Oh, yes, Doc. He can pass us a few things as I ask for them. But be careful. One touch and they go shooting all over the place. Talk about light and airy like a fairy. <laughs> okay, I'll be careful. Then uh, hand us that for a start. Yeah. So. Here, uh, how's the mutiny going? Well, they seem to have forgotten it for the moment. And they're trying to work out our position. You think they'll do it? Hmm? I guess so. But it'll take a long time. Yeah, our real hope is you, Lemmy. Yeah. You and that radio. What made Mitch flare up like that? I don't know. Maybe the thought that he wouldn't get to the moon at all. Or maybe the cramped conditions and lack of gravity had something to do with it. There must be some reason why two men perfectly stable on Earth should jump at each other's throat less than 24 hours after leaving it. It just doesn't make sense. I'm not jumping at anybody's throat. Neither are you. Uh, not yet you're not, but watch it. Do you think we should turn back, Doc? Yes. Unless you can get that radio working. However much figuring we do up here, Lemmy, we may overlook something. We can't be sure our deductions are correct. I think so, too. Jet was right. Mitch ought to have known better. Well, maybe. That still doesn't excuse Jet for losing his temper. No. Can they hear what we're saying? If they were listening, they might. Uh, now, we'll try again. What do you think the chances are, Lenny? Hard to know. Three times I've put this thing together. And each time she should have worked. Mm-hmm. And three times I've had to pull it to pieces again. Even the emergency cutting service don't work. I can't understand it. Makes me feel like I'm letting the ship down. Oh, don't go getting to feel that way, Lenny. Uh, well, now, that's it. For the fourth time. Now, let's see if we get any current through us. Yes, it's there. Yes, we've made it. No, no, wait. Now, let's get too excited. We're not through to home yet. Then give them a call, for goodness sake. Try to raise them, Lemmy. Hello, Control. Rocket ship Luna calling Control. If you love me and can hear me, let's hear from you. Over. Not a peep. They should be receiving us. There's bags of aerial current. Oodles of it. They could hear us on Mars with this equipment. Hey, listen. What's that? I don't know. It gives you the creeps, doesn't it? Haven't you any idea what it is? It sounds like music. Like music I've never heard before. Hey, can I hear a... a, a voice there? I don't know. I can't make it out. Uh, Jet, Mitch, come over here. Listen to this. Got the radio working? Well, kind of. Are you contacting control? We tried to, but whether this is them or not, I, I don't know. Well, if it's not control, then what is it? Search me. Are you sure she's on the right frequency, Lemmy? Yes, so far as I can tell. There's no reason why she should drift off. Not with them crystal stabilizers in there. Yeah, it's gone. Packed in again. Ah, uh, try once more, Lemmy. Call them again. Hello, Earth. Hello, Control. Rocket ship Luna calling. Trying to contact you. Can you hear us? 
Come in, please. Hello, Luna. Can't hear you. Strength, 4.5. It's them. It's them. We made it. Hello. Hello, hello. This is Morgan. Can you still hear me? Hearing you loud and clear. Oh, thank goodness. We've been with you ever since the takeoff. I should think every amateur radio station on Earth has been listening to you. I? You mean you've been hearing us all the time? Except when Lemmy took the radio to pieces. Thank goodness for that. Must be something wrong with your receiving circuit. Well, beats me. I couldn't find nothing wrong. Nothing. Well, you certainly seem okay now. We can give you all the information you require. Want to take it? Try and stop us. And here it comes. The time is now 3 hours, 11 minutes and 54 seconds, universal time. Time from takeoff is 0 plus 27 hours, 11 minutes and 59 seconds. Your distance from Earth is 142,000 miles. Your speed is 4,200 miles per hour. Your position is as follows. Well, that's more like it. Now we know where we are and what we're doing. There's no question of turning back now. According to control, we're on course and our speed is very nearly correct. We should reach the neutral gravitational point between Earth and Moon three Earth days from now. The moon will then be only 23,600 miles away. Our speed will be only a few miles an hour, but enough to overcome the pull of the Earth entirely. From then on, we'll be falling towards the moon's surface. If we were back on Earth, we'd drink to this. <laughs> Cold tea is all we have. <laughs> How about a cigarette, Doc? Do you think the oxygen supply can stand it? Yes, I think it might. Shall I get them, Jack? Yes, Doc, one each. And after that, we'll organize the watches. Four hours apiece. Now, I'll take first watch. The rest of you can get some sleep. You'll need it. We all need it. The toughest part of this trip is yet to come. Hey, Doc. Here, yeah, Lemmy. Push us up a banana, will you? <laughs> Lemmy, must you always eat your meals upside down on the ceiling? <laughs> what difference does it make? Food goes down, who should I say up just the same? Well, it looks undignified. It's a great idea for parties. Think of the room it saves. Anything more to eat, Lemmy? No, thanks, Doc. Okay, then push your empties down. I'll store them away. Here, how about a little after-dinner music? Oh, no, Lemmy, not that. Well, we've got to do something to pass the time. Why did I ever suggest that each member of the crew should be allowed to bring one small personal object with him? Well, I'm glad you did, Jet. Aren't you? Well, yes, but mouth organs should have been banned. Why couldn't he have brought a, a book or something? Every man to his taste. What was that? Amicia, get the ship. Emergency stations. Blimey, emergency. An animal upside down on the ceiling. Let me get the space suits. Don't panic, Jet. I'm on the way. Air pressure constant. We don't seem to be losing any. The media bumper must have worked. Now that we'll find out. Meanwhile, get your space suits on just in case. Ah, here you are. Red for Doc. Yep. Blue for Jet. Yellow for Mitch. Oh, I would be free. Now get into them. Don't fix your helmets yet, but carry them with you all the time. Air pressure still constant. I don't think the cabin could have been damaged. Oh, that's a relief. And what about the fuel tanks and the motor? I'll be checking up in just a minute. Right. That's me, sir. Now get to the radio, Lemmy. Report this to control immediately. Yeah. Now, everybody else, check your indicator readings. See what damage there is. And somebody turn off that buzzer, will you? Well, Doc? Yeah? Air supply okay. Oxygen supply okay. Fuel tanks and motor seem to be intact. No damage there as far as I can see. Hello, Control. Luna calling. Hello, Luna. And meet you just hit us. Emergency procedure. Now we just somewhere. Yes, but Stand we seem to be all right, Jim. Look, Andy Doc, we've boy. just been hit by a meteor. It must have done something to us. But what? Well, how should I know? Somebody will have to go out there and look. What? But out there? O outside the ship? Into, into nothing? I'll go. No, Mitch. This is my job. Besides, you're more important to the crew than me. I'll go. What, you... You, you mean there's a uh, chance that... It'll uh... be the first time any man has ever been out there in space, and I designed the suit he'll wear. You tested it, didn't you? As far as was possible on Earth, yes. But this is different. This is the real thing. Look, let's not start another argument. We'll draw for it. Fair enough. All agreed? Agreed. Right. Uh, Lemmy, get one of the navigational tables. Yes. Open it up, place it face down on the control table with your eyes shut. Right. Okay, here goes. We'll guess the page number. Whoever gets nearest goes outside, okay? Uh, Mitch? 136. Doc? Uh, 127. Lemmy? 149. And I'll take, um, 155. Uh, what is it, Lemmy? 153. Then it's me. 
Stand by to open the airlock. Airlock. Contact. Airlock, full pressure. Open the hatch. Right. I'm going down. Fastening helmet. Over to intercom. Helmet fastened. Okay. I'm ready. Close the hatch and exhaust the airlock. Suit now inflating. Air pressure of zero. What is it, Jet? It's more beautiful than I ever dreamed. What, the door? No, no, the stars. Millions of them. Literally millions. Now, leaving door and walking upside of ship. I'll make a complete circuit. Uh, how's the suit, Jet? Okay? Fine. How are the boots? Perfect. And now, hitching the safety lines. And walking towards nose. Any sign of where the meteor hit us? Not yet. Here, ask him if he can see the moon. One thing at a time, Lemmy. Finding where that meteor landed is more important. I found it. About 13 feet from the nose. That's damaged yet? No, nothing to worry about. Must have been minute. Only a small area of the bumper has vaporized. Let's thank our lucky stars it wasn't a larger one. You must come out here, all of you. Come on. This is a sight you've got to see. We can't all go. Somebody must stay. Uh, look, I'll stay, Mitch. You and Lemmy go. You sure, Doc? Yeah, yeah. Um, by way of compensation, you can let me be the first to step on the moon. It's a deal, Doc. Now, if you wouldn't mind opening the airlock again, Lemmy and I will get started. What a sight. Did you ever see so many stars? So many different colors. Yeah, and they don't twinkle like they do on Earth. There's no atmosphere to make them twinkle. So small they look, and bright. Jeb, how fast are we going? Uh, about uh, 2,000 miles an hour. But we don't seem to be moving. Mountains and craters, Anna. How far off is she now? About a hundred thousand miles. Oh, no distance at all. Company bus ride. Here. Here, Chip. We must be off course. Of course. How do you mean? Well, the moon's not in front of us. It's to one side. She'll be there when we are. She's moving towards our rendezvous all the time. Hey, Chip. Have you taken a look at the Earth yet? Huh? You can make out the African continent quite easily. And the southern ice cap. But the reflection is brilliant. Did you ever see anything like like it. Oh, Mitch, if we never get to the moon, the trip was worth it just for this. Jet, I'm going for a walk down under. See how things look from there. Now, be sure your safety line is secure. We don't want you drifting off. Don't worry, Jet boy. Oh, if only Becky could see me now. She wouldn't know if I was on my head or my heels. No more than I do. Oh, yeah, what's that? It's the funny music again. Hello. Hello. Jet. Jet. Jet! Jet, can you hear me? Jet! Hello, Lemmy. Oh, Lemmy, what's wrong? Jet, that music. Didn't you hear it? Music? What music? Oh, you must have heard it. It was like it was right inside me. Lemmy, pull yourself together. I heard no music. All I heard was you screaming. But I was calling you before that. Didn't you hear me? No. Jet, look, let's get back into the ship. I heard it, I tell you. I heard it. Now, calm down, Lemmy. Stay where you are. Now, don't attempt to re-enter the ship until I'm alongside you. I heard it, I'll tell you. The same kind of music we heard when I when I got the radio working. Only this time, it was much louder. Like it was right inside me helmet. Oh, it was uncanny. It scared the living daylights out of me. It scares me now just to think of it. Lemmy, if there had been any music, it must have been coming through your radio. And we'd have heard it too. But there was, I'll tell you. I was calling you when it first came on. But you didn't hear me till it stopped. Lemmy, lie on your bunk. Get some sleep. What? Well, I don't need sleep. Yeah. You don't believe me, do you? None of you believe me. Now, come and lie down. You believe me, don't you, Doc? You heard that music coming over the radio, didn't you? I wasn't out there, Lemmy. I was here in the ship. What's happening to him, Mitch? What do you think's happening to him? I told you. He's unstable. A psychological misfit. <laughs> You 
have been listening to Episode 1 of Journey into Space with Andrew Foles as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer as Doc, and David Williams as Mitch. Other parts were played by John Casabon. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton. Jet Morgan, Steve Mitchell, Doc Matthews, and Lemmy Barnett are on their way to the moon. Shortly after takeoff, they lost contact with Earth and didn't regain it for 27 hours. Then, nearly two days later, a small meteor struck the ship, and Jet Morgan, after putting on his spacesuit, went out through the airlock to inspect the damage. Fortunately, it was slight, but Jet was so awed by the sight of the universe around him that he asked Mitch and Lemmy to join him. Lemmy, impressed by the novelty of being able to walk right round the ship's exterior, wandered to the other side and out of sight of his companions. And then, strange sounds were heard over his radio. Immediately, Lemmy began to call to Jet and Mitch, but they didn't hear him. Then, as something like near panic took hold of Lemmy... Jet! Jet! The sound stopped, and Jet heard him. The three men then returned to the ship's cabin. What's happening to him, Mitch? What do you think's happening to him? I told you, he's unstable. A psychological misfit. Oh, you're not going to bring that up again. If Lemmy says he heard a strange noise, he heard it. Then why didn't I hear it? Why didn't you or Doc? Doc wasn't outside. How could he? Well, he was listening to us, wasn't he, on the ship's receiver? That and our personal radios all work on identical frequencies. If there'd been anything to hear, at least one of us would have heard it. He must have imagined it. Be careful what you're implying, Mitch. What other explanation is there? Anything could happen out here, anything. Radios could play tricks, the ships, lemmies, anybody's. Maybe there's some kind of radio wave we know nothing about that can only be heard out here in space. Ah, piffle. All right, now break it up, you two. Lemmy's upset enough without you discussing him like he was a mental case. Trouble with this ship is room so limited you can hardly keep your thoughts to yourself. Next time I'll build separate cabins. Tourists, second and first class. No need to be flippant, Mitch. What do you think about this, Doc? I don't know what to think. At first, I was inclined to agree with Mitch. Say, Lemmy's imagining things. And who could blame a man for that out here? But <sighs> Lemmy's not that type. Besides, he says the sound was the same as we all heard just before we contacted the base, remember? Atmospherics. What, on this equipment? It wasn't atmospherics, Mitch. That radio picked up something, no doubt about that. You it... mean it might have been transmitted? Could have been. You'll be saying it came from the moon next well, Why not? There's no life on the moon. How do you know? Have you been there? Oh, for heaven's sake, Jet, what's got into you? Any elementary textbook on astronomy will prove there's no life on the moon. Will it also tell you what lies on the other side of the moon? Well, of course not. No man has ever seen it. <laughs> but how can it be any different from this side? It must be much the same. But you can't prove it, Mitch. And you can't explain the behavior of the radio. Being out of action for so long, then picking up those weird sounds just before control came through. Are you two trying to say that there's life, civilizations maybe, on other planets? We're not saying there is or there isn't. But you can't rule out the possibility. I can. I'll believe it when and if I see it. Until then, I'll be guided by the known facts that life on any planet other than Earth is most unlikely. Why should the Earth be singled out? Why should such a, an infinitesimally small part of the universe be unique? For the same reason that you are unique. You, everything about you, is a lucky combination of circumstances. No, I can't agree. Whether you agree or not is beside the point. But the question in hand at the moment is Lemmy. Oh, I can hear you. Well, for a start, we'll have to make a rule that he doesn't go outside the ship again. Well, there'll be no need for anyone to go outside again. The chances of another meteor hitting us are a million to one against. I don't mean while we're still coasting. I mean from now on, even after we've touched down on the moon. You, you mean you'd let him go all that way and then deny him the right even to step outside? Yes. Unless I can be 100% sure we won't get a repeat performance of what happened half an hour ago. I won't do it to him. Neither will I. But I tell you, Lemmy's unstable. I can still hear you. Look, Mitch, you're being unreasonable. More than unreasonable. I just want to be sure that nothing wrecks this project. That's more important to you than anything. Or anyone, isn't it? You're darn right it is. Sorry, Mitch, but Lemmy carries on as was arranged. What happened outside is going to make no difference. All right. I'll consider myself overruled. If I listen to you too much longer, I'll think you've all gone crazy. 
22nd October, 1965. It is now three Earth days, seven hours, and six minutes since takeoff. The ship has now settled down to a regular routine. Lemmy seems to have fully recovered from whatever it was that scared him outside the ship, and now nobody even mentions it, though it's obviously preying on the minds of us all. Radio contact with Earth is clear and suffers from no interruption. There isn't much to do now. Every man takes his watch. Lemmy plays his mouth organ. Mitch studies his tables. Jet reads his book. And I keep this diary. Our speed is now very slow, not more than 50 miles an hour, and dropping every second. Soon the most exciting, the most dangerous part of our journey will be on us. Lemmy. Yes, Jet? Stop that racket and listen, will you? Yes, Jet. Now, everybody listen. We've now passed neutral gravitational point. The Earth no longer affects us. The moon has taken over and is pulling us down towards its surface. It's only 23,000 miles away now, and the time has come to turn the ship over. Uh, switch on the stern teleview, Lemmy. Teleview up. Stern view on. Stand by. Okay, Mitch? Okay, Jet. Dog? Yeah, okay. Lemmy? Okay. Number one, gyro. Number one, contact. Watch the screen, Lemmy. Nothing happening yet. Oh, oh yes, now it is. One degree, two degrees, three degrees, four degrees. Any sign yet, Lemmy? Not yet. Oh yes, it's absent. Limb of the moon now visible, getting bigger. Blimey, the mountains and craters are as clear as anything. Well, never mind that, keep your mind on the job. Plus one. 1.5. Stand by, Doc. Two, yeah, whenever you like. 2.5. Plus 3. 3.5. Plus 4. Number 1, Gyros. 3. Cut. 5, plus 5. 5.5. Plus 6. We're getting turned too far. Stand by for counter action. Plus 7. Number 2, Gyro. 5. Ready. Plus 8. 8.5. Plus 9. 9.5. Plus 10. Number 2, contact. 10.5. Plus 11. Stabilizer, stand by. Standing by. Stabilizer, now. 10.5. 10. Dead on. Number two gyro, cut. Steady she goes. Okay, that's it. Now leave the stabilizer on for a while, let's be sure. Still steady, on course. Cut it, now, Doc. We're okay. Well, that's that. Easier than I thought. Let me call up base. Tell them the ship has been turned over and that we're now falling towards the moon. What? How far now, Jet? A thousand miles. Getting close? Yes, very close. Now, it's about time we began preparing for landing. Everybody onto your couches and strap yourselves yeah, in. Sure yep. thing, Jet. Let's hope we don't hit her too hard. Yep, safety straps fastened. Me too. Safety straps okay. Then position your control panels. Number one panel in position. Number two. Number three. Four, okay. Mitch, stabilizer. Stabilizer, ready. Contact. Lemmy, course. Spot on. Dock height? 930 miles. Shock absorbers ready? Yes, Jet. Let's hope they stand the concussion. They will. Contact. 910 miles. Still some way to fall yet. Now, let's all relax. Gravity conditions will return as soon as the motor is cut in. Now, don't let the shock take you by surprise. 900. Blimey, and it check it. We could have land on that mountain. No, Lemmy, they're the mountains that surround the bay. Where we're landing is much smoother. Uh, better be. I 895. Landing area, still spot on. 890. Nearly there. Yeah, what's that? What's what? Quiet, Lemmy. 880. But, uh, I can... I can what hear. is it, Lemmy? 875. Nothing, Jet. It's the excitement. Lemmy, what's wrong? Uh, nothing. Nothing, I'll tell you. Take that note. 870. Stand by. I'm going to cut in the motor. Landing area spot on. Lemmy, pull yourself together. 865. 860. 855. 850. Contact. <laughs> Lemmy, watch the screen for heaven's sake. 845. Landing area. Okay. 840. 835. 
This is it. Hold tight. Cut the motor. Gentlemen, we're on the moon. Didn't you hear what Jet said? We just landed on the moon. Doc, let me. I heard him. Yeah, so did I. Doesn't that mean anything to you? By the way you're carrying on, he might have just announced your death sentence. Maybe he has. What's up, Doc? And Lemmy, what's worrying you? Nothing. Now out with it, Lemmy. You didn't hear that music again, did you? Leave me alone. Would you keep getting at me all the time? You did hear it, or at least you think you did. Am I right? Am I? Leave him alone, Mitch. In a minute, you'll be saying you heard that darn music, too. I'm not so sure that I didn't. What? You, Doc? I can't explain it, but just before the motor was switched on, I began to feel very strange. A sense of foreboding. With landing only a few minutes away, how else would you feel? No, it wasn't that. I didn't exactly hear anything, but... Now you're both beginning to imagine things. Mitch, it was not imagination. Well, look, let's forget it for now. We've got work to do and little time in which to do it. Now, get up and we'll start. Right, yes, well, of course. Can we put our magnetized boots on? Uh, no, Lemmy, we won't need those till we return. Now, uh, switch on the main television and we'll see what it looks like outside. Television, Ron. Can't see a thing. Rotate the camera, full circle. Camera rotating. Well, still nothing. If anything, that screen's getting darker. No sign of a picture. The camera's pointing towards the night side of the moon. The sun's hardly rising yet. We, we can't expect anything on the screen. Not even the stars? Oh, we, we should see those, I must admit. Let's wait a bit. Wait till she's turned 180 degrees and begins to pick up the day side. Now here she comes. They're getting brighter. But still no picture. It, it's like the lens is fogged over. <laughs> what are we worrying about? It, it's dust. What? Dust? Oh, of course. The moon surface is covered with it. Volcanic ash, meteoric dust. The blast from our motor when we landed must have caused a regular dust storm. <laughs> we came down right in the middle of it. We won't see a thing. Let's settle again. <laughs> oh, you, you know, for a minute it had me scared. I, I thought the televiewer had packed in like the radio did. Me too. Well, while we're waiting, we'll get ready to go outside. Yeah. And sure not, not you, Lemmy. Eh? Somebody has to stay behind. Oh. We can't all go outside at once. Oh, for a minute, I thought... Oh, don't worry. Next time out, somebody else will take a turn of staying behind. Well, that's fair enough. Now, call up control. Yes, sir. Mitch, Doc, get your suits on. Yeah, sure, Kitty. Right. Hello, Earth. Rocket ship Luna calling control. Come in, please. Hello, Luna. Earth calling. Go ahead. Stand by. I've got him, Jet. Hello. Hello, Earth. This is Jet Morgan. You can tell the world that rocket ship Luna has landed. She touched down in the Bay of Rainbows less than five minutes ago. Oh, I mean, I'll be careful what you say, Jet. The whole world is listening. How was the landing? Fine. Came off beautifully. We hit the target area right smack in the middle. Was the trip a comfortable one? A bit cramped, but otherwise very comfortable. It's almost time for us to go outside. I'll arrange for our personal radios to be fed into the ship's transmitter so you'll be able to hear us talking. And now, if you'll excuse me... Can you see the air? 
No, we won't see it until we've left the ship and have climbed down onto the moon's surface. Uh, put up the ladder, Lemmy. We'll go down now. Ladder. Contact. How's that? Fine. All right, Doc. You first. No, Jet. Let Mitch go. Thanks, Doc. Won't forget this. I feel so light and I want to let go and float down. No, no, Mitch. Don't take any risks. Take it easy. Well, I made it. How's it feel? Fine. Except that I'm ankle deep in dust. And hey, be careful how you walk. I don't think there's a really flat spot anywhere. Down you go, Doc. I can see the earth now, Jet. Come on, come and look. It gives us a chance to get down first. It's so easy to walk. Everything seems so light. Come on, earth. We can see you now. A great ball in the sky about... Oh, four times the size that the moon looks from the Earth. And like the moon, the Earth is passing through a phase. Less than half of it's illuminated. Can you make out the seas and the continents? Africa and Europe are facing us now. Most of northwest Europe appears to be covered in cloud. But the British Isles seems to be enjoying a spell of good weather. We can just make out the outline. The colors on the... Congratulations, Captain Morgan, to you and your crew on your wonderful achievement. Thank you. Hearing you talk to us and seeing the part of the world where you are situated looking so minute gives us a, a, a dreadful feeling of isolation, of utter loneliness. Then there is absolutely no life on the moon? Not that we found as yet. How is London? You'd hardly recognize it. Traffic is virtually at a standstill. Well, I never thought we'd stop the roar of London's traffic, not from a quarter of a million miles distance. Well, you have, Jeff. The whole United Kingdom is with you up there. The telephone lines are jammed with callers trying to book seats for the next trip. What are the chances of that, Jed? How long before there'll be a regular passenger service to the moon? Well, Mitch is more qualified to answer that question than me. What do you think, Mitch? Oh, not for a long time. We'd have to make the moon habitable first, and it's anything but that right now. Is that the ultimate aim of this trip? To make the moon habitable for human beings? Well, in so much as a space waste station on the moon will help us reach the other planets, yes. But it will be no more than a stepping off point to Mars or Venus. Colonization of the moon will be the task of our children or, or our grandchildren. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. I hope anybody else who was thinking of telephoning us took that in. Well, before you leave us, would you mind telling us exactly what your work on the moon will entail? We'll be taking lots of photographs of the Earth, the Sun, the sky, and the moon's surface. We'll also explore as much as possible of the terrain, at least to the limit of our visible horizon, which is about two miles. Even that is probably more than we can manage in one day. One day? Is that all the time you'll be spending up there? One lunar day, and that's equivalent to two weeks back home. We plan to return to Earth just before lunar nightfall. I see. Well, we have lots of messages here for you from all over the world. Can you take them? I'll take them, Jet, while I'm sitting in here. Might be one from Becky's. All right, let me go ahead. Disconnect us from the main transmitter, but keep the intercom open. Intercom, over. Test, please. Hello, one, two, three, four. Okay. And if you see any dragons, give a yell. I'll hear you. I won't be able to help you, but I'll hear you. Hello, Earth. Ready to take your messages. Over. It is now three Earth days since we landed on the moon. Everything is going well. At the moment, Jet, Mitch, and Lemmy are digging out specimens of lunar soil to take back home with us. Up to now, we have found no evidence whatsoever that there is, or ever has been, any kind of life on the moon. It is a completely dead world. Time we went back, Mitch, and let Doc come out. Okay, Jet. Lemmy and I will wait here. When he gets out, we'll continue towards the little crater a couple of hundred yards ahead. Right. Periodically, the voices of Mitch, Lemmy, and Jet come over the intercom as they talk to each other through their personal radios. Every word they say is recorded, for the construction of the spacesuits does not permit the wearers to write their observations. Lemmy is in high spirits. A few hours ago, he discovered that the low gravitational pull on this dead world allows him to jump fantastic heights. He cleared over now. Thanks, Doc. Hatch opening. Air. Anything to report? No. Nope. What have you been doing with yourself? Oh, keeping up my diary. Maybe you should put your mind on modifying these spacesuits. Huh? Find some way of getting rid of the moisture. 
I'm ankle deep in perspiration. Nothing much I can do about it now, Mitch. It'll have to wait till we get back home. Well, get down into the torture chamber and I'll let you out. Yeah, okay. Jet and Lemmy are waiting for you 200 yards north of the crater. Here comes the dock now, Jet. Hello, Doc. Ready for another digging session? Oh, is that what it's going to be? We'll take a few photographs of the crater first. Uh-huh. And then if we can, climb down into it and see what the floor's made of. Right. The Doc, can you manage the surveying tackle? Oh, I can up here. Back on Earth, it would take three men my size just to lift it. Well, let's get going. We'll spend a couple of hours there and then go back to the ship for a meal. What? Hey! Hey, listen! Wait a minute! What is it, Lemmy? The music! It's here again! Get steady, Lemmy! Good gracious. What is it, Jet? I don't know. S- stand still, listen. You can hear it? I'm not sure. It... I can't exactly hear it. It was like... Well, I don't know how to explain it. It wasn't exactly like last time. Not too loud. But just as creepy. It scares me stiff. Did you hear it, Doc? Yes, Lemmy, I did. And it... Jet, the crater. Look quick. What is it, Doc? Something moved in there. I swear it did. Something moved? Yes. Oh, impossible. I only caught a glimpse of it, but it was there, I tell you. Uh, wait here, I'll go and look. No, we... There is nothing on the moon that can move of its own free will. Then why can't we all go? No, Lemmy, you and Doc wait here. If it's all right, I'll tell you, then you can come on. Hello? Hello, what's the trouble? I wish we knew, Mitch. We heard that noise again. Not just Lemmy this time, all three of us. Did you hear it? Are you sure you did? Of course I'm sure. And on top of that, I saw something move in the crater. Ridiculous. I tell you, I saw it. Just hey, just going hey, with... Doc! What? Where's Jack? What? Not a second ago, he was standing on that crater's rim. Now he's not. He must have fallen in. Hello, Jet. Jet, Doc calling. Can you hear me? Jet. Yeah. It doesn't answer. Let's get over there. He must have hurt himself quick. If he's punctured his suit, he's as good as done for. Now, can you see him, Lemmy? He must be lying somewhere on the crater floor. No, Doc. There's no sign of him. The crater's empty. <laughs> You have been listening to episode two of Journey into Space with Andrew Foles as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer as Doc, and David Williams as Mitch. Other parts were played by John Casabon and Alan Keith. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton. After a thrilling trip lasting nearly five days, Jet Morgan and his crew in the rocket ship Luna touched down on the surface of the moon. After contacting the Earth and receiving messages of congratulations from all parts of the terrestrial globe, they set about their tasks of taking photographs, collecting specimens of moon rock and soil, and exploring the area in which they landed. Then, while Jet, Doc, and Lenny were making their way towards their next objective, the strange sounds which they, and particularly Lemmy, had heard on their journey from Earth, were heard again. And then Doc thought he saw something move in the crater ahead of them. Hello? Hello, what's the trouble? We heard that noise again. Not just Lemmy this time, but all three of us. Did you hear it? Are you sure you did? Of course I'm sure. And on top of that, I saw something move in the crater. Ah, ridiculous. I tell you, I saw it. Did you, Doc? We'll see in just a minute. I'm almost at the crater now. If there's anything to see, I shall see it. There. Not a thing. Not... Oh, no. I could swear I'd been through all this before. Hey, Doc, huh? Seen this very crater before. Recognize every detail. Where's Jet? What? If I go down into it, the floor will be soft and powdery like a fresh fall of snow. Not a second ago, he was standing on its rim. Now he is. Every feature is as familiar as my own backyard. He must have fallen in. I have been here before. I've seen it all many years ago. Hello, Jeff. Hello. Duck calling. Can you hear me? He don't answer. Let's get over there. Hello, Jeff. Jeff, hello. He must be in there somewhere. Look for him, Lemmy. Look for him. Look and keep looking. Keep looking. Keep looking. And look hard. Concentrate. Observe the mountains that border the bay. Observe the smooth floor of the bay itself. Well, do you see it? Yes, Uncle. 
The bay is full of craters. Aye, it probably is, but you can't see them. Uh, with a big telescope at Blackford Hill, you might make out some. Wee craters. Lots of wee craters. And, and one is wide and shallow like a dish. What are you talking about, boy? Which one? The one near the ship. What ship? The spaceship. I stood on the crater's rim and made my way down into it. What nonsense is this? I was there, on the moon. Young man, when I sit up half the night with you in this observatory, it's to further your education, not for you to utter such drivel. You know, but your head's full of rubbish you're reading those stupid books and hearing the radio. Spaceship. Ah. It's not rubbish, Uncle. Lots of people think it is, but it isn't. It's a scientific possibility. Is it a scientific possibility that you might try paying strict attention to what I'm telling you? Yes, Uncle. Space travel. When they can't even get the earthbound trains to run to time. Now, look again. Make a sketch of what you see, and only what you see. I want no imaginative drawing, just the plain facts. Yes, sir. Then get on with it, boy. Don't stare at me. Look into the eyepiece. Look. Take a good look. Look hard and long, and keep looking. Keep looking. Keep looking, Lenny. Keep at it. I am looking, Doc. No sign of him anywhere. Perhaps we'd better go down on, onto the floor. Lemmy, you better come into the ship. What for? So I can go out and help Doc look for Jet. That's what for. There's two of us looking already. Lemmy, come in. If you're so keen to come out, come out. I'm not stopping you. You know darn well I can't get out. Somebody has to be inside to work the airlock. Look, Mitch, why not use the televiewer? From up there in the nose, you'll be able to see further than we can. All right, Doc, but televiewer's a Lemmy's province. He should be in here working it. All you have to do is to switch it on nothing complicated about it. All right, that. calm down, Lemmy. Mitch is just as worried as you are. Oh, I'm sorry, Doc. Something awful must have happened to Jet. Hey, Doc. Yes. There's a game. There's Jet in the crater, large as life. What? Jet! Jet! What are you doing here? I told you to wait until I called you to come on. Jet, boy! Are you all right? Of course I'm all right. If Doc did see anything in this crater, it's certainly not here now. I? But the... it was nearly three hours ago. Three? What are you talking about? Can't be more than five minutes since I left you. Jet! What's happening to you? What's happening to me? What's happening to you? So come back to the ship, all of you. We'll try and straighten this out. What is happening? Somebody had better tell me. We better go back. Something very strange is taking hold of us all. Yes, Jet, you'll be safe for in there. Well, if you say so. I don't know what all this is about, but maybe when we do get inside, you'll give me some rational explanation. Now we're all here. What's up? What's up, he says. Jet, when you left us and walked towards that crater, Mitch called us up. That's right, I heard him. Well, both Lemmy and I instinctively turned towards the ship when we heard Mitch's voice. And when we turned back, you'd gone. Of course, by then I was making my way down to the crater floor. Yeah, that's what we thought. But you'd gone so quickly, we thought you must have fallen in. So we came running over. But when we got there, all we saw were your footprints in the dust. There was no sign of you. Is this a joke? Jet, what time did Doc come out to you? As far as I can remember, about 1,600 hours. And how much time do you think has passed since then? More than 10 minutes, I'd say. The time is now 18 hours, 47 minutes. I tell you, uh, picture's clear. Every detail of the surface outside is hard and sharp. Nothing out of the ordinary. Not a thing. No sign of movement anywhere. It's as still as a graveyard. October 30th, 1965. It is now 13 Earth days since takeoff and 8 days since we landed on the moon. Since Jet's strange disappearance, nothing else unexpected has happened. While three of us are working outside, the fourth watches our every move on the televiewer screen. We never wander away from each other, at least not more than a few feet. And Jet has given strict orders that we keep the ship within sight at all times. This has limited the area we can explore and means we stay out of most crater floors entirely. But there's still plenty of work to be done on the elevated surface. Spirits rise as the time for going home draws closer. For although there has been nothing to alarm us for some time, there's a strange feeling of apprehension that we all feel but never mention. All but Lemmy, that is, who seems to have forgotten that anything strange has ever happened to him or to any of us. He's in here with me now, 
while Jet and Mitch are outside making their period. Boom! But don't... It, it covers happening. the whole crater. Well, the one Jet got lost in. It's as though a spherical roof had been placed over it. Well, you're going crack if this screen's blank. No, it's there. Plain as plain. Surely you can see it. No, Doc, I can't. Call up Jet and Mitch and tell them. Tell them to look towards the crater. Quick. Hello. Hello, Jet. Mitch. Hello. Hello, hello, Jet. Oh, they don't answer. They can't hear us. It's that perishing music. Whenever that's on, nobody can hear a darn thing. Take hold of yourself, Lemmy. Try again. Hello, Jet. Let me call it. Can you hear me, Jet? Hello, Jet. Jet! Oh, it's gone. Yes. The dome is gone. Hello? Hello, Doc, Lemmy. Hello, Jet. You can hear us. What's the idea? We've been calling you for a couple of minutes. Calling us? What's wrong? Were you asleep? No, Jet. We weren't asleep. You saw, with as much detail as you can remember, but okay. only what you remember. Okay. We don't want an imaginative drawing, just the plain facts. Now, while you're doing it, Mitch and I will watch the televiewer screen, see if anything else turns up. Come on, Mitch. Hey, Doc. Did you switch the televiewer off? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't remember. Well, it is off. I suppose it was on when you saw this, uh, dome. What do you take me for, a practical joker? Turn it on, Mitch. He probably switched it off unconsciously. Well, there's the picture. Hey, what's this? Huh? Oh, it's Doc's diary. What the devil's he putting in it? It's a private diary, Mitch. None of our business. Oh, isn't it? Not even this? Huh? Look at it. Read it. My whole enthusiasm and interest in the trip is gone. We should never have come. Man has no right here. No right to carry the secrets of this planet back to Earth. Back to terrestrial beings who can neither understand them nor appreciate them and in consequence will only attempt to destroy them. Rip them to pieces. Tear them apart. As they have already begun to destroy their own planet. Did the doc write that? Well, it's his handwriting, isn't it? Yes, but... We'll tackle him with it later. What does he think he's doing? Does he want to demoralize all of us? I don't know, Mitch. I don't know anything anymore. Now, Doc, have you finished that drawing? Yeah, I finished it some time ago. Here, it's as accurate as my memory will allow me to make it. Hmm. Uh, the dome seemed to be made of some transparent material, and the low circular wall that supports the dome seems to have been erected on the crater's rim. It fits the rim exactly. What did the walls seem to be made of, Doc? Uh, I don't know. Some kind of metal, maybe. Well, it's a curious object, all right, but it doesn't tell us much. Nothing like so much as Doc's diary tells us. What do you mean? This is what I mean. What you wrote here today and then left lying around for all of us to read. What are you trying to do? Demoralize all of us? I don't know what you're talking about. You made it plain enough in here. You want us to know... You've lost all enthusiasm for this trip. That we should stay up here, die up here. Have you gone crazy? Oh, no, but maybe you have. What with domes over craters and, and then this. Let me see it. Well? Hmm? I didn't write this. It's your handwriting, isn't it? Yes, but I... I... Then, then wh what did you write? Show me. Go on. What I wrote isn't here. Ah! I merely recorded the normal events of the day. I give you my word, Mitch. I don't want it saying I'm a liar? Well, if that's how you want to put it, yes, I am. Now, hold on there, Mitch. You hold on yourself. Shut up. What else is he? There's the book. Shut up. I mean, nobody's calling anybody anything. We're going to get to the bottom of this calmly and without insulting each other. Now, Doc, did you write this or, or didn't you? Well, if I did, this is the first time I realized it. Then what did you write? I just told you that normal... Doc, were any of the thoughts expressed on that page in your mind while you were writing? Yes, I suppose they were, but they weren't important. Ideas like that must have passed through the minds of all of us. It happens to everybody. You think of things you have no intention of doing, would hate to do, in fact. Like when you're in a car and the sudden fear of a possible accident strikes you, or when you make an air trip. But you don't have the accident. That's what those thoughts were like. But I had no idea I put them down. I would have sworn on my life that I just wrote about the work. How many days we'd been here, the, the date, the time. Nothing like that on this page. There is on yesterday's page, I grant you that. Give him back the book, Mitch. Hey? 
Give it to him. To go on writing this dribble? I said give it to him. Huh. Thanks, Mitch. And Doc. Yes? Whatever anybody else thinks, I believe you. Thanks. You believe him? And why not? The things that have been happening to us since we've landed here, I'd believe anything. You would, eh? Well, I don't. Nothing's happened to me. It's you that's crazy, all of you. Cut it out, Mitch. That's it. You're all going crackers. All but you. You're the only one still in step. We're all crazy but you. Ah, I get it now. The whole thing's a conspiracy. Something the three of you have cooked up to try and send me crazy. So when I get back to Earth, I'll be considered unfit to make any further trips. Mitch. Then the field is clear for you. The exploration of space, the, the glory of it is all yours. While I, who designed this ship and built her, kick my heels back on the deck there, watching you going and coming. <laughs> but you won't do it. Mitch, don't I'll see nonsense. you don't. You can stay here, all of you. Die here, like Doc says. Mitch. Oh, God. Oh. Yeah. Help me get him onto his bunk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tell him you're clear. Nothing to report. <laughs> Mitch, you all right? I, I, uh, what happened? I hit you, Mitch. I had to. You, you were raving like a lunatic. Oh, well, I'm sorry, Jet. I, if I do that again, you hit me again. What are we going to do, Jet? Exactly what we came up here to do. But what's the explanation of all this? I don't know. The only thing I can think of is that somebody, something, is getting at us. What? Getting at our minds in different ways. Lemmy hears music and it scares him. Makes him feel he wants to go back home. You see things, unexplainable things. And write things in your diary you, you don't intend. Mm. And Mitch? He seems immune to the whole business. Except when we talk about it and then look what happens to him. That crater out there seems to be connected in some way. Hmm. We'll examine it thoroughly by every means we have. What, all of us? No. Mitch and I will go out. You stay with the televiewer. Okay. Keep us on the screen all the time. Watch every move. And let me will stay by the radio and record every word we say. You agree to that, Mitch? Yes, Jet. Dust or the floor underneath? Can't tell. Maybe over till later. Jet and Mitch now on crater floor, approaching each other, getting stronger. Hey, Mitch. Hear anything? Getting stronger still. Mitch, do you hear anything besides the counter? Building up fast. Needle's going like mad. Hello, Earth. What was that? Hello, Earth. Spaceship X 4372. Venus to Earth calling. Homer. Lemmy, is that you? Spaceship X-4372, receiving you, Homer. What on earth? Hello? Take off satisfactory position and velocity as per schedule. Over. Hello? Thank you, Venus. Next call will be at one Earth hour. That is all. Hello, Mitch. Lemmy, Doc, can you hear me? Hello, Jet. What's the trouble? Hello, Jet. Hello. Hello, Doc. Oh, watch where you're going. You're walking at right angles to the correct line. You've gone out of camera range. Sorry, Doc. I, uh, I'll put it right. What's up, Jet? Lost your sense of direction? Yes, Mitch. But not in the way you mean. And then I heard a spaceship that just left Venus call up Earth and give his position. What? That's not likely to happen for years. Fifty, a hundred, maybe two hundred. I heard it. And at the same time, the whole bay seemed to be full of structures. Radio masts, rocket platforms, and vehicles like tanks which were speeding along well-made roads. The bay was full of movement, as though a lunar base was already built and in full working order. It was... Well, it, it was like a, a glimpse into the future. Yes! That was what it must have been. Just as a few hours ago, I must have had a glimpse into the past. Let's go home. We're not going home. None of us has been hurt, not physically. These moments are rare, only just a few seconds. 
We can't leave the job half done. No, Mitch, we can't. We'll carry on. Whatever it is that's got hold of us, whatever it's trying to do, it won't stop us. It won't drive us off, not until we're good and ready to go. Is that agreed? Agreed. Sure, agreed. Lemmy? Agreed. We'll leave that crater alone. From now on, nobody's to go with a hundred yards of it. That clear? It'll be a pleasure. Certainly well, let's get started. Back to normal routine. about it, Doc? All complete. I don't think we left anything behind. Murder, Mitch? All set? Well, get on your couches. Strap yourselves in. Oh, boy. Well, it wasn't so bad after all, was it? Yeah, Rick, they must have heard us say nothing would stop us. They gave up trying. They, it, or whatever it was. <laughs> I'm beginning to think we must have dreamt the whole business. Yeah. Dome, music, everything. A whole week, undisturbed. And now we're going home. <laughs> to dear old mother up from Becky. Switch on the telly, Lemmy. Lemmy. Let's take a last look round before we leave. Tell your gear on. Goodbye, Moon. Thanks for the use of the bike. Yeah, shadow's creeping up fast. Moon must look almost a crescent to the folks back home. Ah, look. There's the flag we raised the day we landed. Yeah. Looks lonely, doesn't it? Yeah, lonely's right. Especially without the tiniest breath of wind to disturb her. No, she just hangs limp against the pole. Doesn't move. Switch her off, Lemmy. Switch on stern view. Stern view up. All set? All set. set. Yeah. Doc, gyro. Gyro. Stand by for count off. We're going home. But we'll be back. Firing in 15 seconds. Piccadilly, here I come. 10. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Contact! Well, press it. Press the switch. I did. It, it didn't work. What? Press it again. Still nothing, not a flicker. But on final check, the motor was okay. There can't be anything wrong. Hey, Jet, the radio's cut. And the radar. Oh, now the televiewer's going. Listen, the gyro. It stopped. Everything stopped. There's not a thing in the ship that works. You've been listening to Episode 3 of Journey into Space with Andrew Folds as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer as Doc and David Williams as Mitch. Other parts were played by David Jacobs and Duncan McIntyre. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton. <laughs>